Mr Rudd, nice of you to join us. We finally heard from Aung San Suu Kyi about the crisis in her country, the Rohingya crisis. Has there been a failure to lead thus far? I think what Aung San Suu Kyi has faced is um, a total dilemma. And that is, uh, under the constitutional arrangements in Myanmar uh, 18 months ago, when she became effectively uh, the country's uh, head of government, mm. uh, the military at the same time retained full control over external and internal security and basically can act uh, as a state within a state. So I think what Aung San Suu Kyi has found herself in is a position whereby the military have been effectively free to run their own affairs and whatever statements or directions that she may make um, may or may not be adhered to by the military. And the consequence of that is uh, that uh, affects her credibility at home and most critically mm -hmm. affects her credibility around the world. But that is a test of leadership, isn't it? This is someone who comes to this position with a great moral authority. She said, even though she is not the president, she has said effectively she would occupy a position above the presidency. She is a Nobel Peace, uh, Peace Prize winner, criticised by other Nobel Peace uh, laureates for not doing enough. Has she not exercised that full moral authority and indeed failed the test of leadership? Well, obviously, I think uh, the Aung San Suu Kyi could have handled some of these challenges that she's faced in recent times in Rakhine State better. I think she would probably agree with that as well. But the bottom line is this, moral authority is one thing, he who controls the barrel of a gun uh, in Myanmar is another. And what she has faced is not just that reality, but also the constitutional and legal reality that the military have absolute freedom to do what they wish. And I think the bottom line here is here, we need to keep our mind on two things. This atrocious humanitarian disaster for the Rohingya and Rakhine state as many of them flee across the border or towards the border with Bangladesh on the one hand, but at the same time a military who have been very uncomfortable within, within Myanmar, having Aung San Suu Kyi in a position of some political authority and I think looking for any pretext to return to full military rule. That, I think, is the game that's underway as well within internal Myanmar politics. Now, what we have on the ground is up to almost half a million people having fled. We've heard from UN officials describing this as a textbook case of ethnic cleansing. But listening to Aung San Suu Kyi today, she wasn't unequivocal. She spoke about the violence coming from the Muslims. She spoke about the development on the ground. Uh, she spoke about the difficulties in trying to bring peace. If people were looking for an unequivocal condemnation of what has happened, she didn't deliver that, did she? Well, the bottom line is uh, she will know that sh every word she utters is being monitored by the Burmese military, who are always looking for a pretext to resume full formal military rule. That's the first point. The second is what I found most significant about her speech this evening is that she did not reject the statement by the UN Human Rights Commission uh, about uh, his allegation of ethnic cleansing within the country. If uh, she was going to, uh, as it were, deny uh, what uh, had been put forward by the UN Human Rights Commission, this was her opportunity to do so. Instead, what did she go on to say? We want to establish all the facts on the ground. Anyone who's found responsible for human rights abuses will be punished, and they'll be punished in full accordance with the law without fear or favour. And we are now, now need to establish these facts. So I interpret the speech with a degree of more subtlety than perhaps uh, others may read it, and that is she's saying, I'm not repudiating what the Human Rights Commission said at all. I want to get to the bottom of this, and the code language is uh, the military and part have run amok. Mr Rudd, let's turn to another issue facing the United Nations General Assembly, and that is the question of North Korea. We're going to hear from Donald Trump. Uh, he will address directly that in a, in, a, in a statement to the Security Council. He's already spoken about reform at the United Nations. Is the UN capable of reining in North Korea, albeit sanctions have been applied, but they don't seem to have had the impact? I think, Stan, we've just got to call a spade a spade here. Since Kim Jong-un has been in power in the last six years, we've had about 93 missile tests. Uh, and since 2006, 
which goes back from before he took over, we've had six nuclear tests. So each of those has resulted in a UN Security Council resolution. Some of those have resulted in a fresh set of sanctions, including about a week or so ago, mm. and none of them have stopped this guy's nuclear program. So the bottom line is this is all very good and useful in terms of normative statements of international law and rounding up our Russian and Chinese friends into a combined action against the North, but none of it so far has caused Kim Jong-un or the regime to stop or to further reflect on the continuation of the program. So do you then fear the worst here? We've had threats from the United States about using military options. We've seen the, the, the continued provocation, as you've outlined there, from Kim Jong-un. What is your worst fear here, and is it likely to be realised? Look, I think, um, Stan, there are three scenarios here, and I'll be very brief mm. about them. Number one is that... Um, uh, the United States simply over the next year or so eventually accepts the reality of uh, North Korea having intercontinental ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads capable of threatening US territory including the United States mainland. That I think is uh, what the Chinese for example assume will happen. What I know of Washington politics is that that fundamentally offends every internally held red line within the administration. So what's the second scenario? The second scenario is diplomacy as currently conducted fails mm. and the US resorts to a form or other of a military strike. I don't think it's probable but the possibilities are going up and I think in my judgment hang now around about 20 or 25 percent. Certainly enough to cause me concern. Mm. And the final, I think, scenario, uh, Stan, is this, and this is where we should be paying a lot of attention. The current diplomacy is not working. Therefore, you need a new diplomacy, a new diplomacy which goes to the bottom line of Chinese long-term concerns about the future of the Korean Peninsula. What they don't want is to see a reunited Korea, a US ally on China's border. Mm. How can you therefore bring about a grand bargain which satisfies Chinese long-term security interests, those of the United States, denuclearizes the North and finds a way through this? That, I think, is where the new diplomacy should go. And the problem there is where does that, how does that new diplomacy work its way through? What is the architecture? Again, you come back to, to the questions of reform of the United Nations. Some have said that there is a need for reform of the UN Security Council. Uh, countries like uh, India being included or Germany or Japan. Where is the architecture for allowing that grand bargain that you've spoken of? Well, to be blunt, I think it lies with four countries alone. I mean, I'm a great respecter of the United Nations as an institution. It sets international normative frameworks, and if we didn't have it, we'd have even more of a law of the jungle than we currently have. But in terms of this specific crisis we face on the Korean Peninsula, there are four relevant countries, in my view. China, the United States, mm. North Korea and South Korea. That's where the action lies. So what you need is an arrangement which, first of all, gives us breathing space. The Chinese proposal, a freeze for freeze, they say, a freeze on US uh, military exercises with the South in exchange for a freeze for uh, uh, North Korean uh, missile and nuclear testing, with some variations on it, I think has got some merit to at least buy us some time. And then secondly, if that does buy us some time and you then end up in bilateral one-on-one -on -one negotiations uh, between the United States and North Korea, backed by the Chinese and the South Koreans, you could get to the four or five elements of a long-term grand bargain, which is US diplomatic recognition of the North, a peace treaty replacing mm. this temporary armistice we've had since 53, but most critically, external security guarantees for the regime in Pyongyang, and on the other side of the ledger, uh, the cessation of the nuclear program and the abolition of the existing arsenal. That's where it's got to go long term. And keeping in mind we've been down this road of talks before and we've seen the frustration and the failure of them in the past, but we'll save that for another day. Good to talk to you, sir. Thank you again. Good to be with you.